Good evening, everyone. My name is Candice, and I'm an event manager. On behalf of Town Hall Seattle and World Without Hate, it's my pleasure to welcome you to tonight's live stream panel conversation with Reis Buyan, Dia Han, and Mark Wright. As we get underway, I would like to acknowledge that our institution stands on the unceded traditional territory of the Coast Salish people, particularly the Duwamish. We thank them for our continued use of the natural resources of their ancestral homeland. And thank you all for tuning in. Town Hall is proud to be a community-focused organization and a place where uh, we can share and sustain ideas and creativity, even if it means we can't gather in person. I'd like to thank Race, Mark, and Dia for appearing tonight to help make that possible. Town Hall will be continuing to produce virtual content this fall, and many of our past talks are available in video or podcast form on our digital media library. Town Hall and the nonprofit community at large have been put under significant strain to, due to the event cancellations and the ever-changing landscape. We hope that you will consider extending your generosity to help support us during this difficult time by making a donation by clicking the donate button at the bottom of your screen or becoming a member. For viewers who want to watch this broadcast with closed captioning, we recommend viewing via the YouTube stream. Uh, that link is here in the chat. To enable real-time closed captioning, click the CC button in the uh, bottom right corner of the video player. The video will be available for re-watching immediately following tonight's broadcast. Tonight's presentation will be about an hour, followed by Q&A. Mark, as our moderator, will select questions from those submitted in the Ask a Question field at the bottom center of your screen. You can also submit questions on YouTube in the chat. Uh, you can also, if you're viewing in Crowdcast, vote on those questions. Uh, we can't guarantee that we'll be able to address every question, but we will try to get to as many as possible. Please keep your questions concise in the form of a question. Town Hall's work is made possible through your support and the support of our sponsors. Our civic series is supported by Real, Real Networks Foundation, Truebound Foundation, KUOW and Wincote Foundation Northwest. Finally, Town Hall is a member-supported organization, so I'd like to thank all of our members watching tonight. And now to our program. Our moderator for this evening is Mark Wright, and he will be introducing our panelists, Race and Dia, in just a moment. Mark is an award-winning anchor on King 5, the NBC uh, news affiliate for Seattle. He is a four-time Emmy winner for his work as a documentary producer, anchor, and reporter. A native Washingtonian, Mark is a dedicated servant leader, including, included, uh, including as a Rotary Club of Seattle president from 2017 to 2018, and as a current board member of World Without Hate. Exploring the possibility of a world without hate is the subject of tonight's talk. Please join me in welcoming Mark Wright, Race Buon, and Dia Khan. Candice, thank you, and uh, welcome everyone. I'm so grateful that you've decided to gather with us here at uh, Virtual Town Hall Seattle. I'm a huge fan of Town Hall and I'm so grateful that Town Hall is continuing its value, valuable programming during the pandemic. And I honestly cannot wait to get back up to the physical Town Hall just above the freeway in Seattle there. It's truly a gem for our city for what it is and what it does and newly renovated. So let's all meet back at the real physical Town Hall once this whole pandemic thing starts to settle down. So I'm honored to be with you. Once again, I'm Mark Wright. I anchor the evening news for King 5 in Seattle. I'm here in one of our conference rooms and it's very smoky outside. If you're not from the Pacific Northwest, we have tons of wildfires here right now. I'm also a member and uh, as Candace said, a past president of the Rotary Club of Seattle. It's a nonprofit service organization that helps those in need here and around the world. And uh, as Candace also said, I'm very proud to serve as a board member for the nonprofit World Without Hate, which you'll learn more about in just a bit. Tonight, we are very honored to have two of what I consider two of the most extraordinary people in the world when it comes to working on ending hate, um, each in their own unique way. First, Dia Khan is a celebrated filmmaker and activist. She's joining us from the United Kingdom, where it is literally in the middle of the night. Dia is feverishly working to finish editing two projects, two films that she's working on right now. Dia was raised in Norway to parents of Punjabi and Pashtun heritage. Dia is literally shining light on hate all over the world. Her films have brought her audiences face to face with 
Islamic militants, extremists in the Middle East, neo-Nazis here in the United States, and a British Kurdish family who murdered their daughter in a so-called honor killing. Dia believes through story we can find understanding and in doing so help to work to end hate. Here's a trailer from one of her latest films. It's called White Right, Meeting the Enemy. Take a look. My hair okay? It's not flying around in funny directions. So as you know, I am a woman of color. Yes. Yes. Uh, I am the daughter of immigrants. Mm -hmm. uh, I am a Muslim. Mm -hmm. I am a feminist. Uh, I am a lefty liberal. Um, I wouldn't <laughs> I have ever guessed. Race, so. And what I want to ask you mm -hmm. is, am I your enemy? You're not subjectively my enemy, but what you are promoting will lead to the, dis the disappearance of my people and my culture. And I will tell you this, it annoys me tremendously when I'm told by some immigrant or a child of immigrants that the only reason my country is worthwhile is because people like them have come here. It's as if to say, my ancestors built a dung heap and I don't doubt your goodwill, but your goodwill is objectively going to lead to the oblivion of my people. I'm sorry, there is no other way to see it. My name is Dia Khan. I'm an activist and filmmaker. When I was six years old, my father took me to my first rally against racism and fascism. I grew up in Norway, where white skinhead gangs terrorized our small Muslim community. My father told us things would change, but extremism and racism are on the rise again in Europe and America. I decided to meet people who think the white race is under threat and that I am their enemy. Get a heart attack. I met neo-Nazis. Jews and homosexuals, they should be exterminated, every single one of them. <laughs> History will decide who is superior. Men who say they've lived lives of racist violence. Prepare to burn, you've attacked our people, and now it's your turn. I've hurt people horrifically with my bare hands. I've been to prison, I've kidnapped people, I've harmed people. I've done things that you would think I'm insane. And I sat down with the new leaders of the white nationalist movement, men from privileged and elite backgrounds. We did it, we took it. We took it with force. We won. Shame! Shame on all of you! Shame! I joined the extremists on the front lines of the race wars in America. I wanted to see if I could understand their anger. To get to know the personal reasons why they are drawn to such hatred and division. So that's just a little bit of the film White Right meeting the enemy. Uh, Dia, it's great to have you here. Thanks for being here. Thank you. It's such an honor to be with you. Thank you for having me. All right. I want to introduce Race Buyan now. Race is the founder and president of the nonprofit World Without Hate. That organization is dedicated to ending cycles of hate and violence through empathy and storytelling. Race is a friend of mine, and I want to tell you a personal story. The day that I met Race for the first time, I don't know if you've ever met someone like this before in your life. You probably have. The day that I met Race, I said to myself, this is one of the most extraordinary people I will ever meet in my lifetime. And several years later, he's a dear friend of mine, and I'm still saying that to myself and now out loud. Here's a short video clip that explains just a little bit more about Race's story. Take a look.
So there is a little bit of Race's story. Um, we're here on 9-11. I, I think it would be most important for, for our audience tonight to just learn a little bit more about both of you, two very extraordinary people. Since we're marking the anniversary of 9-11 tonight, Race, and since you were attacked by uh, a white supremacist 10 days after 9-11 in retaliation for what happened um, on 9-11, I'd like to start with you. Race, take us back to that time when you were attacked by a man named Mark Stroman in Dallas. Well, uh, thank you so much, Mark, and thank you for having me as well. Um, after uh, graduating as a pilot officer from the Bangladesh Air Force, I didn't feel my destiny was there. And my American dream kept calling me. Eventually, I left my career, my family, and my home for New York City to pursue computer science. Growing up uh, watching Wild Wild West movies, I couldn't resist the invitation to visit Dallas, Texas. Excited to see the ranches, cowboys, and bars with their famous swinging doors, though I never find one. Uh, as, a, as a new immigrant, there was a lot to see, learn, and process. I honestly don't remember experiencing any outright hatred or discrimination uh, in my early years. Um, in fact, I recall being embraced and welcomed. When, uh, when coming to America on a Singapore Airlines, for example, I was curious to see the cockpit of the 747 Boeing and uh, talked about it with a flight attendant. To my surprise, I, the captain invited me into the cockpit and we were served refreshments while we chatted. When uh, working at the gas station, uh, most people were friendly, curious to know where I traveled from and what brought me to America? I felt I was quickly becoming comfortable with the people and the culture of America until 9-11 happened. Everything changed immediately. Traditionally friendly customers became angry. They looked at me as if I was guilty of something. I no longer felt safe. It did not take me too long to realize that my life in America would never be the same. 10 days after the attacks, as the rescuers continued to search ground zero for signs of life, our country in deep mourning, a newfound fear and uncertainty looming, I began what would be my last day of work as a store clerk in Southeast Dallas. Around noon, a man wearing a bandana, sunglasses, and a baseball cap holding a sort of double barrel shotgun burst in. Pointing the gun directly at my face, he asked me, what are you from? And before I could say anything more than excuse me, he pulled the trigger from point blank range. I felt at first like million bees were stinging my face and then a hearty explosion. I looked down and saw blood pouring like an open faucet from the right side of my head. Frantically and instinctively, I placed both hands on my head, thinking I had to keep my brain from spilling out. And I remember screaming mom on top of my voice. And I looked left, saw the gunman is still standing there. And I thought if I did not appear to be dying, he would shoot me again. After a few seconds, he left. And I went to the barber shop next door, begging them to call 911. And as they did, I caught myself in the mirror. The image reflected back was gruesome like something out, straight out of a horror movie. I was lucky, ambulance arrived quickly, and on my way to the hospital, I started feeling um, that I was about to lose my consciousness and images of my mother, my father, my siblings, and my fiance appeared before my eyes and then a graveyard. I promised God, if he gave me a second chance to live, I would do good things with my life. I would dedicate my life for others, especially for the needy, deprived, and for the poor. Hmm. So we'll pick up the story. I don't want to spoil the whole story for, for people who have not heard your story yet, but I want to let you know that one thing Race did was he fought for his attacker's life on death row, trying to speak on his behalf, but ultimately befriending him through correspondence and in the process transformed that man's life completely. And we'll get to what he told you the day he was executed in just a little bit. 
Uh, Dia, I want to I want to talk a little bit about your your background. You were raised in Norway. Tell me what that was like. the The trailer that we saw from your film it sounds like at times it was a very difficult upbringing. I mean, Norway is a, is, is in many ways a wonderful place to grow up, uh, but also being uh, you know the child of immigrants, uh, being the the sort of dark. Uh, child in the sea of blonde and blue-eyed children was um, always something that, well, well, I guess you don't realize that you're different until people um, remind you that you are. So as a child, you know, I was, the house that I grew up in was very loving, very supportive. Uh, my dad always, you know, encouraged me to, to be whoever I wanted to be, to dream whatever I wanted to dream. And, and I never felt any limitations on that until I set foot outside. Uh, the house where people would suddenly remind me that, well, actually, you look a certain way. You're not quite one of us. You you might not even stay here for the rest of your life because this isn't truly your country. So you're at some point you're going to go back to where you came from, even though I was born there. Mm -hmm. um, so it would be you know sort of you know sort of minor experiences like that, and then you know being bullied at school, and you know then facing racism growing up, but then also you know having more severe experiences of our uh, family friends, our own uh, family members and uh, friends of the family being attacked, being harassed, some of their shops being um, attacked and bricks thrown the, uh, through the windows. Um, so it was, it, was a, it was a tense place to grow up. Uh, Neo-Nazi groups were you know, free to march in the streets. I remember I, when I was around 13, 14 years old, I used to skip certain classes to go to some of the counter protests against the skinheads in the center of Oslo. Um, so it was racism was sort of a present force in my life from early early childhood, uh, mm. throughout my teens, um, and 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 racists um, were some. I mean, I when I would go to some of these protests, you know, throughout my teens and and later teens as well, you know, I would throw things at them, I would shout at them, I would call them all kinds of names, and 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 be sort of you know really obnoxious in return. Um, but it never got anywhere, you know? It didn't, you know, it's not like it, it made my life any better or changed their life in any sort of way. So, um, so I left that sort of period of my life afraid of people like that and also very, very angry at people like that and thought that that's where my feelings would remain when it comes to those people. Yeah. Um, Ray said that before 9-11, he noticed people treated him a certain way where were you on 9-11, uh, Dia? And, and do you, did you notice a shift in perception of people of color? Yeah, uh, so I was in London, actually. Um, I think the world changed for everybody, not in as obviously drastic of a way as, as for race, but I think for everybody who's Muslim, uh, life changed that day. Um, I think for anybody who looks like they might be Muslim, life changed that day. Um, I mean, it was a devastating day, obviously, for, for all of us. Uh, but I think, I mean, I, I remember, you know, my brother would be afraid to travel to America. Uh, so I come from a Muslim family. And, and you know, he, he would sometimes say, well, you know, maybe if I wear a cross, you know, maybe it'll be easier at the airport. You know, so the, the way that, the, that we're treated at the airports, the, the, the suspicion and the fear that you could see in people's eyes, um, and, and to be honest, I mean, that fear and, and, and that suspicion also, you, you would see the desire for something either aggressive or, or outright contempt and hatred for you. You would see it. Hmm. And I don't know if those feelings were there before and maybe 9-11, you know, sort of opened the door for people to feel okay expressing those feelings or starting to, to, to act on them or if, if that just was the catalyst and the trigger. I suspect that the, the latter is probably the case because I do think that Muslims were sort of invisible, especially in the American psyche. I think Muslims didn't particularly exist other than whatever they'd seen in, you know, you know, flying carpets and, and you know, other sort of really obnoxious yeah. uh, tropes, sure. um, you know, so. Um, so yes, life changed. I Absolutely. want to talk with you about your films and when you decided to become a filmmaker and let that be your, your uh, tool to helping to fight hate. But first, I want to go back to, to finish Ray's story. So, Ray's, when did you decide to forgive your attacker, Mark Stroman? He was he killed two other men. He was put on death row. He was convicted of your attempted murder. 
But there was a point when you decided that you aren't going to hate this guy, that you were going to forgive him. And not only that, you were going to try to befriend him in the process. When, when did that happen? Well, you know, Mark, as a, as a result of this shooting incident, I underwent several eye surgeries. And unfortunately, though, I lost vision in one eye. And um, I still carry more than three dozen bullet fragments in my face and skull. I, as a result of the shooting, I lost my home, my sense of security, my job, and my fiance, but gained more than $60,000 in medical bills. And I reached out to the Red Cross and was informed that I was qualified only for one week's worth of groceries. When my father heard what happened to me, he suffered a stroke, but thankfully survived. And you know, there's not a single day that goes by that I'm not reminded of this painful tragedy, but I continue to make peace with my pain. So you see, I suffered terribly, and um, but I did not see any value in him suffering as well. Um, the change came uh, when I was in Mecca in 2009, along with my mother. And I deeply thought about my shooting incident and my attacker who was sitting on death row waiting to die. And I realized that, that his execution will not solve the problem in this world, will not eradicate hatred once and for all from this world. I began to see him as a human being like me, not just a killer. I saw him as a victim too. And I realized if he was given a chance, he might become a better human being. And I, all the stories of powerful, all the powerful stories about mercy and forgiveness I learned in my childhood gave me the courage and strength not only to forgive the man who tried to end my life, but also fight to save his life. So you tried to contact him while he was on death row. You wanted to go visit him. Uh, the Texas uh, prison system didn't didn't want you to do that for some reason, which is kind of bizarre. Um, fast forward, you've corresponded through mail. You've you've developed a relationship with him. The day that he was executed, you were able to talk with him. Tell me about that conversation. Well, that was a very um emotional conversation because I was about to go to the court for the last hearing and he was sitting next to his execution chamber. Uh, it was July 20th, 2011. And I was, uh, uh, I was told that he would like, Mark would love to talk to me uh, before this execution takes place. So around 4.15, I, I called the prison system and they told me I cannot talk to him. I called again, same answer. And I don't know how to take no for you know no no easily. So I called one of his friends and I said, "What is going on? Why I cannot talk to him?" And I was lucky at the time. Mark was talking to that friend through a landline, and that friend told me, "If you want, I can put you on a speakerphone, and I can make it a conference call. Let's go for it." So Mark came on the line on, from the other side, and you know what? Can you really tell a person who is about to be executed? Not because of you know he's you know not because uh, he, I mean, a person who is about to die, not because of age or because of you know serious illness, is a perfectly perfectly healthy man, but because of his you know severe mistake, he was about to be executed. And as soon as he came on the phone, I felt very emotional, and I said, "Mark, you should know that I forgave you, and I never hated you." And he said, "Race, I never expect this from you. I love you, bro." And once he said that, I love you, bro, I couldn't hold my tears. He's the same human being 10 years ago. He shoot me in the face for no reason other than hate and ignorance. And he's the same human being 10 years after calling me brother and saying he loved me. And then he said, Race, keep doing what you are doing and, uh, and continue your human rights work. And suddenly he said, Race, I have to go. They're calling me. And then he left. Wow. That's an amazing story, Race. Um, we'll talk about how that led to you founding World Without Hate in just a little bit. Adia, I want to go back to you. And uh, the films that you've made have been not only award winning, but they have just been extremely powerful films. Um, one of the films. Uh, well, take us through. The, the, the first one of your films was about a so-called honor killing, correct? Yeah, that's right. 
That's right. I mean, I, and and before I say that, I, I just I've heard racist story uh, many times, uh, and never do I go, oh yeah, 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 yeah. That's what he did. That's what happened. I'm always just in awe of him, yeah. uh, and also in awe of Mark Stroman, his his attacker's transformation. I mean, it's just any time I I look at what's going on in the world, and I feel as if maybe hope is slipping through our fingers maybe you know we can't change things maybe uh conflict resolution isn't something that that is is within our reach i think of this story and i just it it really is so touching what happened between these two men uh it just Every single time, I, I just um, I, I'm so 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 moved, and I realized, you know, if that's possible, then really we 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 can't be giving up <laughs> on ourselves or, or on people, you know. So, um, but but back to your question about the 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 films. Yes, the very first first film that I did was about this uh, young uh, Iraqi Kurdish woman who whose family had fled uh, Iraq and moved to South London. Um, she was pushed into a very violent marriage at the age of 17. Um, she tried to leave that marriage, but the family and the community sort of pushed her back and said, you know, you, you just, it's probably you, you need to try and be a better wife to this guy and, you know, see how that goes. Uh, the abuse continued, she left. Um, and in the process of trying to rebuild her life, she found a man that, young man that she loved. And the community found out. They saw them holding hands and, and kissing outside of a, a London train station. Uh, and a decision was made by the community that, that that had brought such shame and dishonor on the family that she had to be killed, basically. So she was um, raped and strangled and, and put into a suitcase naked and buried six feet under uh, under an abandoned house in, in um, Birmingham. Yeah. Um, and the reason I wanted to tell her story wasn't just because a lot of my friends have asked me, oh, you know, it's it's such a horrible story. You know, is that why you wanted to tell it? And I said, well, no, I wanted to tell her story because it is, it contains within it all of the lessons that we need to learn. Because as much as this happened to her while she was alive, she'd also gone to the police in London five times asking for help and never got the help. Um, but in death, her case was taken on by, by a, a policewoman named Caroline Good, who extradited three of the, two of the killers from Iraq, brought everybody to justice and, and, the reason I told her story is when I met this policewoman, I said, look, you could have taken your medal, your pat on the back, uh, once you'd arrested you know, the father and the uncle and just left it at that. So why did you go above and beyond like this when you had no family pushing you for justice? Um, and just under her breath, she just murmured, she said, because I love her. And I was like, how can you love somebody you've never met? How's that possible? And she said, well, everybody should be loved. And this girl should have been loved. And if the people who should have loved her didn't, her family, then she should still be loved. So I love her. So to me, I wanted to tell that love story as well, because to me, that's the solution. That's where the solution sits. It's not just about the brutality. It's actually about how do we get out of these problems? It is by caring about each other. That's how you fix it. You know, and she proved that if she could have been, if this young woman could have been met with that level of caring and that level of love when she was alive, if she's abandoned by her family, then who needs to step in is the rest of society. It's the rest of us. So we failed her. Um, so that's why I made that film. And then I've, as you said earlier, I've made films about violent extremists uh, of all forms. <laughs> um, and again, trying to find in darkness where there might be a little bit of light, where there might be the possibility of exploring what the solutions might be. Uh, where is the possibility of transformation or how could this have either been prevented or how do we prevent this in the future? What do we learn from this? Yeah, I want to dig a little deeper into that. The family that killed their own daughter, um, the Islamic extremists, the neo-Nazi skinheads in Charlottesville. What thing do all of those people have in common when it comes to the hate that they express? I think it's all rooted in fear. Uh, I think it's all rooted in um, a lack of sense of self, 
I think they put their sense of identity and their sense of self on somebody else's behavior and somebody else's existence rather than taking responsibility for their own life. Um, I think they feel, I, I think they're, they're, them acting out and lashing out in violence is sort of trying to mask um, whatever's going on with them, whatever brokenness, whatever ugliness, whatever trauma, uh, whatever um, emotional vulnerabilities or human needs that they have that are not being met, they're trying to compensate for that by lashing out and putting all their stuff on somebody else instead. It's not me, nothing's wrong with me. I'm not the problem, you're the problem. Mm -hmm. So let me just justify you being the problem by lashing out at you. The hardest thing in life is to look at ourselves. For any of us, you don't have to be a neo-Nazi <laughs> to struggle mm -hmm. with that. All of us, the hardest part of life is to clean up your own internal stuff, all the baggage, all the messes, all the brokenness that we all carry with us. Um, it's far easier to say, actually, let me just be angry at you. It's, it's more satisfying, it's easier. So I would say the kind of common denominator and the common um, traits that all of these people possess uh, was that, the, the inability and the, the, the lack of tools and capacity to address their own internal um, uh, feelings hmm. Ray's and traumas. You, thank you. Uh, Ray's, as, as you got to know Mark Stroman, um, and you also got to know his son uh, and have sort of mentored him, he's also in prison. Is he still in prison as well? Mark's son, yes, he's still in prison, but he's, he's about to be uh, released on parole. Let me ask you, Ray's, as you got to know Mark Stroman, your attacker, better, what did you learn about what made him end up that hateful man who walked into the convenience store with a gun? Well, once I learned more about my attacker, Mark, I, I found that uh, he had a poor upbringing and, um, you know, um, also the letter he, he wrote to me from death row where he explained how he grew up and um, how his stepfather taught him all the, you know, extremist, um, you know, ideology and as, as a very young, you know, uh, at a very young age. And he grew up learning a lot of negative teachings from his stepfather. And one thing um, I particularly remember that he, um, he couldn't speak clearly as a child, so other kids would make fun of him in the class, and he would come home crying. And his father would would, uh, would punish him again for not fighting back with those kids. Mm -hmm. And his his stepfather would put him on grass again, and he was allergic to grass. And um, you know that pushed him to fight back because he didn't want to be punished again at home. So at a very young age, he started fighting back with those other kids in the school. His family failed him and um, the school system failed him. And when he had his first parole officer at the age of 12, that prison system also failed him. He never got a chance to repair and rebuild and rehabilitate. Mm -hmm. He was going in and out uh, of prison. And uh, when 9-11 happened, he was already you know, um, filled with you know, bitterness, you know, ignorance, intolerance, and then hatred. And, and watching the same footage of you know nine of uh, nine eleven, uh, seeing the planes hitting the twin towers, and listening to uh, some of the politicians and commentators, made him snap. And he ultimately was pushed to take up arms against innocent human being. And in his own statement, he said that at the end, I end up paying a big price because I listened to those politicians those news media clips, day and night, they've been rolling day and night. And ultimately, I'm the one paying a big, uh, big price. And, you know, uh, he, he came to this understanding when he was locked up, in the worst possible place on earth, in death row. There was no way out of this place. It was a one, one good thing for him that he was finally, as Dia mentioned, that he was finally able to find himself in that worst possible place on earth. And he started learning more about the world, 
more about Holocaust, more about you know uh, about himself as well than where he came from. And it's very shocking that he had a swastika tattoo on his neck, and he didn't know his grandmother was Jewish. And then he he learned uh, he read uh, Victor Frankl, and he was so ashamed that having the swastika tattoo on his neck. So he ultimately removed the tattoo. So this transformation took place in the worst possible place. But when he was free, he was totally a free man, but he was locked up in his mind. And I would like to say this, that um, in a statement he said when he was in death row, that in a free world, I was free, but was locked up in a prison inside myself because of the hate I carried in my heart. But it is due to racist message of forgiveness. I'm more content now than I've ever before. It's a powerful statement. The topic of our panel tonight is combating hate, um, empathy through storytelling. As you have shared your story, Race, um, what kind of a transformation, what kind of power have you seen your story? When you tell and share other people, you've spoken in prisons all over the world, you've spoken in schools, um, you've developed mentoring programs for kids in schools. If you, as you've shared your story, what power have you seen your story in terms of how it empowers other people and how it transforms other people? Well, you know, stories are powerful. Stories, um, you know, challenges us to reflect on ourselves, our values, morals, and beliefs. Uh, and it also helps us to, to find, you know, empathy, understanding, and acceptance of the other. And I would give you uh, just a couple of examples. I was invited to give a talk at a maximum security prison in Italy. Even though I don't speak Italian, I had a translator. And in the middle of my talk, an older gentleman, you know, walked up to me. I feel a little nervous, maximum security prison, and this man started walking towards me. Though uncomfortable, I looked him in the eye and I saw his eyes were full of tears. And I could tell that maybe he was extremely moved by my story. And he wanted to either, either say something or wanted to toss me or something. So when he came close, I saw his eyes were full of tears. And he extended his, his hand to shake my hand. And we embraced each other. And he told me that, that um, he would never know the person he hurt in the free world would, would ever forgive him. But he wanted to touch me because I forgave the person who tried to end my life. That brought tears in my eyes, eyes as well, that this, this older gentleman came to this understanding in a maximum security prison. And the other story I would like to say that in the, at the end of last year, I was asked to uh, meet the founder of an armed hate group. And after five and a half hours of conversation, and Dio was there as well, and the feel free to chime in. And after five and a half hours of conversation, he told me, though it was very uncomfortable, but it wasn't worth it. The time we took and we got to know each other, shared our stories, it was really meaningful and productive. And he invited me for a lunch to continue this conversation. And what I learned from that that he not only changed his thoughts and views by hearing my story and also having conversation with me at the same time, but I learned from him as well. I deeply learned, you know, about him and what made him a person like this today, what went wrong, and the struggle he had at a very young age. And he still he's struggling to find a purpose to, uh, to lead a meaningful life. This wouldn't be this wouldn't be possible until and unless we sit having an uncomfortable conversation and uh, wanted to learn and grow and make a difference. So Dia, let's talk about the power of story. You've decided to make a career out of, out of storytelling because you told me the other day that you really believe in the power of story. It's, you told me it's how we make sense of the world, but you also said that that story brings us to a place of empathy unlike any other form of communication. Hmm. Tell, tell me more about, about why story is so important to ending hate. Well, I, I, I think, you know, just, just listening to Race tell his story, you know, he, he just listening to him explain what happened to him and what happened to Mark Stroman, 
opens up a window for us. It, 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 you know, it, it gives us an opportunity to understand something that we think we might already know or have very strong opinions about already and might shine a, a slightly different light on something. And I think once we learn, the, the reason I think stories are so important is that it places us in the shoes of somebody else. It gives us a perspective uh, and an outlook on life that we might not hold ourselves, but somebody else does. And once we're able to, to get to see and even experience, feel some of the feelings that somebody else might have gone through, it changes, it changes our own. And, and the entire purpose of why I make films, you know, I, I actually come from a music background, have, have had no dreams or desires of, of, I want to be a filmmaker. I never went to school for filmmaking. No, still really nobody in the industry other than just a handful of people. So it's for me, the reason for doing it and doing it so obsessively is just in the, in the desire, as I said earlier, to try and see if there's light in, in all these really dark places, all these really, really dark stories, where's the light? Trying to seek that out. But also, I'm always looking to see where I can find little tiny, tiny cracks that might appear where we might be able to recognize our humanity in each other. Where are those moments? Where are those possibilities? Uh, and the reason I'm always looking for that is because I think that's where the possibility of change, the possibility of learning and understanding, and ultimately a possibility of a deeper connection to each other um, exists in that space. And why does that matter? It matters because the, the, the minute, just like Race just said too, the minute we feel for each other, feel about each other, learn about each other, understand each other, it becomes far more difficult for us to hate each other, far more difficult for us to inflict violence on each other. Um, and ultimately that's the goal is, is, you know, we need to quote unquote, get to know each other better. Um, and people think that that's sort of naive or a cliche or whatever, but I've always believed that. And then when I did the, um, uh, the documentary, White Right Meeting the Enemy, the clip that you saw earlier, um, I did that because I had done an interview with the BBC, uh, basically defending multiculturalism, like you know, defending our multicultural societies that we live in now. I didn't think it was a particularly controversial interview, but anyway, it ended up going viral, parts of it, um, and ended up on uh, like racist websites, very, very hardcore websites, both in the US and some places in, in, in Europe, but mainly in America. And as a result of that, uh, I was inundated with death threats, flooded with death threats to the point where the BBC were like, you need to take this seriously, you need to call the police. And the police came and they're like, you need to stay away from windows, you need to do this, that, and the other. Anyway, uh, and I didn't really take it seriously because I've also had death threats from Muslim extremists in the past. So I was kind of chuckling at, at times, reading some of these threats going, sounds like the same guy to me. The threats are the same, the, <laughs> the, what they say they're gonna do to me is the same. So I was going, you know, I've, I've, I've done this before. I'm not gonna, not gonna take it that seriously. But it continued and just got worse and worse. And then I had to make a decision. I've always been afraid of people like this. As I said earlier, I've grown up being uh, exposed to people like this. And so what do I do? I've got two options. I can either continue being afraid and I can hide from this, or I can try and do something that I've never done, which is try to seek them out see if they're willing to sit with me face to face and see what happens. Is it possible for them to see me as a human being? Can they recognize my humanity? And also, can I recognize theirs? Because it's not just them that holds the, their views and their baggage. I also have a lot of baggage about them. And I, you know, I'm not gonna deny that. I have all kinds of prejudices too. Uh, and have sort of dehumanized them in, in my mind and my heart too. And so that's how that film came about. Um, and, and in the process of making that film, and I ended up at Charlottesville and, and ended up at, you know, really awful, awful um, uh, training camps uh, in the mountains of Virginia and, and various places and, and, you know, was threatened um, and, and got very close to, to some not great things happening. <laughs> uh, and I was, you know, pregnant at the time anyway. Uh, but all of that to one side, with most of the men that I met with, uh, we've ended up becoming friends. And not only have we ended up becoming friends, 
three of them have since left and 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 renounced the the ideology and 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 the the movement that they were a part of and now are actively working against racism and actively working against hate uh, so to me i've seen it mm -hmm. i've seen it in real life and happening in real time i've seen it fall away so to me i'm not saying it's always possible every racist is possible to reform or every extremist is possible to reform but some of them are and that tells me it it uh it's worthy of our effort for those of who those of us who want to engage with people like that and i'm not saying it's the burden of of victims and of and victimized communities to have to go reform their abuser you know not everybody is is race yeah. and and i and i understand that and i wouldn't expect everybody to try and be race uh, but for those of but for those who have that in them uh in a way, that's what we need on the front lines of this. We need these kind of peacemakers. We need these peace and reconciliation kind of um, experts, in a way, to go out there and engage with the people who nobody else wants to engage with and see what's possible. Because it is possible to change. They, they can change. I, I, as I say, I've seen it. I always knew it kind of instinctively that people ultimately are just people. Um, but, you know, Somebody with a swastika, as Ray said, you sort of go, well, yeah, yeah people are people, but, you know, really, do you want to bother with this? Yeah. Um, but, you know, in, in, in my case, I would say, yeah, it is worth it. And, you know, so many of these guys have given up on themselves. They've given up on us. Mm -hmm. And so if we do the same, then we've lost. We've lost them. We've lost part of our own humanity, I think, because we're also dehumanizing them by giving up on them. I do. Uh, Sorry. Grace, can I ask you, uh, on a fairly regular basis, um, across the country, we have hate groups protesting and counter protesters coming together and they scream and yell at each other and, and fight. The police come. Um, I'm guessing that that's not what you recommend in terms of winning over people who are part of hate groups because but it's just this is a this is a scene that just gets played played almost nightly especially in cities like Portland where these hate groups are 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 rallying and then the the opposition comes in when people ask you race what what the answer is what do you tell them well the answer in short in one word is respectful dialogue hmm. whatever is your problem and whatever is their problem means there is a problem in our society there's a problem that's why one group is you know um is shouting on this side of the street and there's another group shouting on the other side of the street that means there's a problem so we cannot solve this problem just by shouting at each other carrying you know ar-15 or ak-47 that's not the way to solve any problem as i said that when you know, Dia and I sit with that, uh, with the founder of that you know, armed head group, I mean, we connected in a human capacity, right? We, uh, we, we listened to each other and it was not easy. It was really, you know, blood boiling. It was, sometimes I got angry, I got frustrated, but I felt so calm that I'm here to build a bridge, not to destroy. So that's what we need to do right now. Whatever there is a conflict, we need to find ways to have a dialogue. Doesn't matter how tough, how uncomfortable it is, we need to come to an understanding that we will listen to each other respectfully. As there's a problem in the society, we all want to get beyond these issues and problems so that our next generations can, you know, can get a, a better world from us. But because the world we inherited today, I'm not gonna blame the previous generations, but there are a lot of mistakes, a lot of wrong things done in the past and as, a, as a result we inherited this world today so back to your point dialogue dialogue and dialogue respectful conversation yeah i feel like our society has just really start gone like this i mean with the rise of cable television 24 hours a day um, i think our political parties have have become more extreme in this country and and I think we really have lost the ability to have that political dialogue in our country. When I can remember a time, I've been in this business for 30 plus years, there was a time when 
our U.S. senators would argue like cats and dogs on the Senate floor, and then they would go to the Senate gym or the Senate dining room, and they would sit down and talk, and they'd say, okay, yeah. what do you need? What do I need? Let's, let's get something done. And I, I feel like I feel like Dia that we have we've gotten so far away in the political spectrum from the ability to respect the other side. It 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 seems like our political system is almost completely broken in this country because both sides have to win. Yeah. What's your perspective? No, I think you're absolutely right. I mean, I think I think it's that, but I also have to say you know, one of the reasons I started making films was also I was very frustrated by how stories were being told by mm -hmm. by the, I mean, just to say the big kind of generic label media, you know, I think that the kind of the, the stories in our public discourse and our public space that are being told about each other is being told by news media, it's being told by, you know, mass media. And, and I think um, that has not done us uh, uh, very well by us either, because I think that it's the, the, a lot of the polarization, I think, also comes from that. In, you know, if the only stories you ever tell about Muslims is that they're terrorists mm. and they're coming to get you, that no wonder Mark Stroman would be afraid. Mm. You know, it's so so so. Yes, Mark Stroman has to take responsibility for, for what he believes, but it's also again, it goes back to stories and what stories do we tell about ourselves and each other and about how we how we fit or don't fit with each other. So I think the public discourse absolutely has become very toxic. It's become very divisive. Um, and I think the political leadership now in particular, I think, uh, but, you know, it, it wasn't that great previously either because this, this division has been very deep for quite a while. And I think it's just being more and more inflamed. And, and I understand, you know, when you're saying about, you know, talking about what's happening on the streets of Portland and in other cities across America, I understand that there is a place for anger. I don't begrudge people the fact that they're angry and that they're frustrated yeah. about what's going on. I understand that. And that absolutely has its place. But what we also have to think about is what comes after the anger, you know? So, so how do we actually resolve this? Do we just, it's, it's like me. I, I, I was like those protesters myself. As I said earlier, I used to flip people off. I used to shout at them. I used to throw things at them. I was very aggressive in return. I, I would meet aggression with aggression when I was younger. Mm. And truly, what did that accomplish? It accomplished, I felt really self-righteous. I f it felt really good, not gonna lie, I felt great being horrible to a racist and a Nazi, you go, I did something great today. But really, what's the point? Did it accomplish anything? Has it reduced racism or, or the number of racists? No. Has it resolved anything in my life? No. So we have to, as much as the anger has its place and the aggression, I can understand where it's coming from, what comes after and what has to come after are the strategies that race is talking about. Dialogue has to be how we resolve this. We've seen this in other parts of the world, in other conflicts. You have mediators, you have people that are working on conflict resolution. We're going to have to start implementing those very same principles in our own countries and in our own societies here in the West, You know, where we make it possible for people to have forums where they can sit and listen to each other maybe with an experienced guided hand, a mediator or something, where these difficult conversations, as Grace is saying, are possible to be had so to see if we can unpick some of these knots. There's no getting around this or under it or, or over this. We're gonna, we're gonna have to get through it. And the only way to get through it is we're gonna have to listen. We're gonna have to listen to each other. Um, otherwise, there's, there's, there's no way we get out of this. This is gonna get worse. What you're seeing in the streets of America will get worse if dialogue isn't put on the table properly. Yeah. Um, I remember as a young reporter in Spokane, um, I traveled over to Hayden, Idaho, the world headquarters of the Aryan Nations, and I was invited to interview a man named Richard Butler, who was the founder of the Aryan Nations. Notorious character, and I remember driving into the compound with my photographer and there were armed men with these military style weapons and watchtowers and brown shirts and and I had a discussion with with Richard Butler and it was really enlightening because he started quoting the Old Testament you know about separating light from darkness and I 
after the interview, I, I went home and I'm, I'm opening up the Old Testament and looking up light and darkness. And I'm thinking, oh, my gosh, he's he's completely misinterpreted the Old Testament of the Bible. And these guys that are his followers don't realize yeah. what he's doing. And it really yeah. made me realize uh, that ignorance is a huge part of hate and that. Yeah. And I'm not saying that they're bad people, but for whatever reason, they their minds closed off at some point. Or like Ray's, you said in the in the case of Mark Stroman, his stepfather actively taught him this, these teachings. And and kids are so vulnerable that way. Um, Dia, I wanted to ask you one more thing before we've got about five more minutes before I want to open it up for our questions from our audience. The other day you said we need to confront the softer side of racism, in the world and. You know, here at King Five, we're launching a a, a series of programs starting this Sunday after Sunday Night Football, and it's called Facing Race. It's going to be half-hour programs, all dedicated to understanding race and racism. Um, and I've gotten, I just got a voicemail just just now. A guy left me a voicemail that said, "You have it all wrong, Mark. You are such a part of the problem that you guys are blowing this way out of proportion." I got an email from a retired Seattle police officer who said I was the reason that our society is going down the tube. He said in all of his years at the Seattle Police Department, he's never seen one instance of racism. And yet we've covered dozens of, of instances of racism. <clears throat> but when you talk about the softer side of, of racism, a lot of people still have racist ideas. And a lot of people are in denial about white privilege in America. Tell me the role that 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 sort of subtle racism plays in ending hate, because it seems like it's still on the spectrum, right? It is absolutely on the spectrum. I mean, the, the, the Mark Stroman's of the world or the neo-Nazis that I've met with uh, or the leader you, that you're talking about, they're the very, very extreme manifestation of, of racism and of hate. So, uh, uh, you know, when I talk about, you know, there has to be dialogue and we have to engage with people like this, um, I don't mean that everybody should go out and do that. I think there is absolute uh, a spectrum. Uh, there are people that will not wear the swastikas on their necks. There are people that will not wave the, the, the racist flags, but still hold, as you're saying, problematic views, mm -hmm. everyday racism, basically, and, and how that plays out. And I think what uh, every person out there can do when people think about, well, what can I do? This is such a big issue. I don't want to be going and talking to white supremacist gangs or whatever. You don't have to do that. I think what we all can do is confront racism uh, in our everyday life. We, at, at the at the you know Thanksgiving dinner with your uncle that the, that makes the, the unpleasant comments about brown and black people or about women for that matter. When you have uh, you know I, I've spoke to somebody the other day who said oh you know my mother she she you know watches certain kinds of you know news outlets and you know and holds really problematic views about immigrants and about people who are dark skinned basically. And you know, I'm I just try not to have any contact with her. And 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 you sort of go, no, 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 no. That's exactly where you step in. Those are exactly because I said, why wouldn't you step in? It's your mother. Why wouldn't you talk to her? And he said, well, because it's just going to be really uncomfortable. And I obviously hold completely different views than her. But that's exactly where you have to enter. You have to enter. That's where going back to what Race was saying, having those uncomfortable conversations. If we don't have those uncomfortable conversations. We can't be complaining about these issues. We all have an active role to play in this. Hmm. Uh, and it's not to go reform a racist. It's to unpick the, the, the racism that exists in our own friend circles, in our own family circles, in, 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 in the circles of our colleagues, and to start calling it out, but not calling it out in, in a way that um, degrades somebody else's feelings necessarily, but but, we have to make it possible for people to listen. We have to make it possible for people to want to engage in this conversation. If you just make it like uh, the vegetables that they don't want to eat, <laughs> nobody's going to do that, right? So we have to, you have to make it possible. You have to invite kind of people, lure people in to want to have the conversation. And you can't do that by, by slapping them and calling them names and, and being horrible back to them, right? So you have to be compassionate in your own approach as well so that they can kind of relax and trust you enough to be truthful mm -hmm. and to be honest. And then you can be gently truthful and honest back to them. And I think one of the, what you asked me a bit earlier about what do hateful people have in common? I think some of the other words also based on what race was saying that, that 
is now kind of coming to my mind, is I think humiliation and shame are two devastating uh, feelings to have to carry with you. Most of these people feel humiliated. Mm. So it makes it easier for them to humiliate somebody else. And so if, if you attack them, you're, you're, you're picking at their very wound. So the only thing they're gonna do is become defensive mm. and you're not gonna have a conversation. So again, we have to facilitate the conversation properly as well. So that it becomes possible to have honest conversation and let people say even the, the horrible things because then you can get past it. Hmm. Because that's, I hear that I've spent a lot of time with Trump fans, for example, across America. And a lot of them will say, oh, political correctness, you can't say this anymore, you can't say that, you can't blah, blah. And I'm like, okay, okay, stop saying that. What is it that you really would like to say? What is it that you don't think you're getting to say? Just say it. Hmm. Well, you know, we should be able to say this, that. I said, no, no, not should be able, just say it. I'm giving you the opportunity to say it so that you can stop complaining about that so we can move along. And, and once it gets to it, it's a couple of kind of awful things, but then you sort of go, that's it. Mm. That's it. That's your, that's your chip that you're carrying over here. Mm. Anyway, I'm digressing, but, oh. but you know, we have to have those conversations in our everyday life. Yeah. Before we uh, open it up for questions, Reza, I wanted to give you an opportunity to tell us about the work that your organization that you founded world without hate is doing just to give people an idea of just some of the some of the good work that you're doing well um during my campaign uh, i received tremendous amount of uh, positive energy and support from all over the world and i was inspired um, to establish the nonprofit world without hate to keep my to honor my dead bed wish that I promised to God that I would dedicate my life for others, especially for the poor, needy, and deprived, and also to continue my journey to inspire people to be more compassionate, empathetic, understanding, forgiving, and accepting of, of others. And um, you know, the, the mission of this nonprofit is to break the cycle of hate and violence. You hurt me in the past, and now it's my turn to hurt you back. We are seeing this kind of cycle in, a, um, uh, in our society. You're, we're, we're trying to hurt each other in the worst possible in the worst possible ways, and nobody wants to give up. Nobody wants to look like weak or vulnerable. So, World Without Hate is dedicated to disrupt the cycle of hate and violence, and we have programmings for uh, for all ages, starting from uh, uh, from elementary school to all the way corporations, uh, nonprofit, and uh, different religious and civic uh, institutions. So to find more information about this nonprofit, I would ask you to visit the website worldwithouthate.org. And if there's any question or concern, please feel free to reach out to us. And also you can find us on Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn as well. Okay. Well, at this point, I would love to uh, get some questions from the audience. Um, uh, here is a comment from Candice. Dia, I'd like to ask, Oops, where did it go? There it is. Um, Candace asks, it seems that both of you put yourselves in positions that are very stressful, very traumatizing. I wonder if you could share how you take care of yourselves, your own mental health and your families, and what do you lean on to maintain hope in humanity? Dia, why don't you start with that one? Well, I mean, I, I think, uh, yes, <laughs> it's very traumatizing, actually, a lot of it, and quite stressful. Um, for me, I think, you know, being spiritually centered has been really helpful. Uh, uh, I had to start uh, praying and meditating <laughs> to just keep myself um, from losing it. Um, I think also, I think having really meaningful um, relationships in your life, I think having really good friendships um, and a lot of love <laughs> in your own life, I think is really important. Uh, because it does, it, it, I don't know how race feels, but I, I do feel uh, the strain of, you know, putting yourself in the kind of the firing line of, of just, you know, absorbing people's stuff. Uh, and actually, I mean, you, you must go through that a lot yourself, um, you know, doing the kind of work you do. Yeah. Uh, you know, as I said, you know, I'm not a trained journalist, you know, I, I didn't come from sort of the media space, you know, coming more from this as a kind of, from an artistic background. 
you're supposed to have a very open heart. You're supposed to be very empathetic. You're supposed to be, you know, for me, those are kind of my tools, but that also does expose me to um, absorbing people's negativity and people's stuff a lot in a very intense way. Um, so I would say, you know, a, a spiritually centered uh, life is really important. Race, what my- about you? I mean, Race, I, I, uh, you and I have been friends for, for a number of years now, and I, I don't want to overstep, but I'm guessing that what happened to you has left permanent scars, correct? Permanent, not only physical scars, but permanent mental scars as well. I mean, how have you, how have you recovered and then how do you take care of yourself now? Well, I will answer the last question first, that how I recovered, I prayed a lot. Hmm. You know, once I get my life back, the next day I woke up in the hospital. I The first thing I, I said to God that, thank you. I was begging for giving me a second chance and you gave me. So thank you very much for giving me a second chance. But that happiness did not last for long. The hospital, which was private and expensive, and I had no health insurance at that time, they discharged me and asked me to arrange follow-up treatments on my own. I call this incident as the second part of my American nightmare. So you can imagine my life was completely, almost destroyed mentally, physically, psychologically, emotionally, but I found God in my life. And I prayed and I prayed and I prayed that God, you saved my life, you take care of it. All the scars I had on my face, all the cut mark, all the dots from the, from the gunshot. I mean, I have pictures, nobody would recognize me now if they see those pictures. And I pray God that you help me to lead a normal life, to come back to a normal life. So prayer really helped me a lot. And, you know, that's why, you know, um, I find a lot of peace and comfort through, through, through prayer, through my, you know, increased faith. Mm-hmm. And that is the same thing I try to do for my attacker as well, that, you know, I, I did my best to give him, you know, to offer him comfort and peace. Even though he was locked up in death row, the worst possible place on earth, but I extended my my love, my forgiveness, and my friendship to him. Mm-hmm. And even though at the end, we could not save him physically, but we we were able to save him mentally because at the end of his life, he said that uh, hate is going on in this world. Mm-hmm. It has to stop. Hate causes a lifetime of pain. In the beginning, he thought this world would be a better place if I did not exist. But when he found love, comfort and peace from his victims. He told me to continue my nonprofit work, my human rights work, and help people to get beyond prejudice, intolerance, violence, and hate, and make this world a better place for our next generations. So I find a lot of peace through this work because I truly believe that the more we do for others, the more the path of our own happiness and common good mm-hmm. will open. Doesn't matter how tough it is, but we, we have to do it. And uh, I know my time is limited because I was almost, I almost died one day 19 years ago. So I know how precious this time and our time is limited. I don't want to waste my time behind doing something else. I would like to do something that brings smile on my face, on others' face as well. So that at the end of my life, I would like to feel accomplished that the time God gave me, Mm. it was worth of living and I utilize my time the best I could. Um, thank you for the questions, and I wanted to let those of you know who are watching, you can vote for your favorite question, and I'll, I'll gravitate to the ones with the most votes for now. Um, Gerald, Dia, let me ask this of you first. Gerald asks, much of media benefit financially from telling exciting, divisive stories. How can that be changed? And I think when we, you know, I've been in this media landscape for a while, and, and it's, I don't know that it's, it's, I don't, I have... Let me just say that I've noticed it more pronounced at the network level than at the local level. I think mm. I think some of the networks have really decided that if we take this position, we can make a lot more money from from this group. So, Dia, how how do we change the media landscape, which is siloing people and then making a lot of money from this? Well, I think it has to. And, and Gerald, I completely agree with what you're saying. I think that, the, and that's why I was mentioning it earlier as well, is I do think that media has a huge part to play in this, and they have played a part in this that's actually been a, a negative part. And I think the way that we uh, change that is by letting them know. I think, you know, who's the media for? 
the media is for us. You know, who's supposed to consume it? It's us. Who is it that tunes in? It's us. So I think we have to start letting the media uh, and whatever outlets the, 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 that we have a problem with, I think we need to start letting them know that we won't stand for this. We don't accept that you create more fractures and divisions in our communities and between us as people. So we don't want content like this. You know, it's also actually why we're seeing um, it's why we're seeing the rise of a lot of kind of alternative media. You're also starting to see a lot of, uh, uh, you know, really, um, I mean, I would call it sort of fake news. I know it's being used in all kinds of ways now, but, you know, a lot of content is being put out there now as a result that's, that's uh, terrible. Hmm. It's inaccurate. But I think that kind of yearning for something other than this really... Um, us and them kind of narrative that's that's put on our TVs. I think people want something different. People feel like they're not really being informed, not being given the information that they actually want. So they're going to all kinds of sources now that are unverified and are actually terrible, are actually making things far worse, to be honest, and are helping to radicalize people further, not less. So I think we need to let our sort of established media know that we want something different from them. This is, it's, it's, it's time to shift this. Race, what are your thoughts? Well, when you talk about media, uh, media is run by some human beings, not by some aliens from Mars or from Jupiter. It's some human beings like all of us. And there's a dis huge disconnect with those people, those who spread fear, intolerance, hate, and violence for their personal benefit and power and you know whatever you can call that. And the people who are the victims of their hate and their ignorance and uh, whatever they spread through media, my take is that we need to find ways to you know close this gap the people who spread fear intolerance hate and violence for some material benefit they need to share they need to hear as we are talking about stories how stories can you know uh, increase empathy or you know, debunk myths and you know hate and violence the people who spread you know fear uh, ignorance hate intolerance through media we need to find ways to share some of our human stories and how their hate, their intolerance affect those victims' life, how those victims, you know, um, struggle every single day after they face, you know, extremely, you know, um, hate and violence. So they need to know about that. Maybe that time they will realize that what they've been doing. And interestingly, many of them uh, come to an understanding or change their hearts and minds either at the end of their life or when they face something terrible in their own lives. But we don't want that to happen. We want those people behind media, spread fear, hate, need to hear more human stories and how their hate affect their lives. Christy has an interesting question here, a couple of them actually, but I, I want to ask this one first. She says, can you both, for the sake of giving us all something to focus on too, excuse me, say what your vision is for our country right now. What do you see for us in five years in light of the work that you're doing? right now. So Dia, why don't you start? So I'm not American, uh, but I've spent a lot of time in America filming and I've, I've been to, I feel like every corner of the US at this point. Um, you know, I've, and I've been going to America for, for the last 15, 20 years. And I have felt with every year, with every trip that I've gone to America, things are getting more and more worse, uh, more and more uh, difficult. Um, uh, and I think the, the, the divisions are deepening and the fractures in, in your society is absolutely um, deepening substantially. And the last few times, even before COVID, I could feel like the tension, like it's becoming palpable now, like you, you can really feel that it's different than it was before. And I think in, in, in line with the, the kind of concepts that Race and I are talking about, I think it's becoming more and more urgent the dialogue and, and, and the kind of acts of listening and acts of empathy and compassion be inserted into the public discourse in the US, I think is becoming absolutely urgent. Having said that, I don't see any signs of it on kind of the, the higher levels of either politics or the media or anywhere that, that, that could connect the masses in America in a more profound way. I don't see it happening. Um, Having said that, I think these convulsions that are now happening in the US, you know, post George Floyd's murder, 
I see some glimmers of hope there because I think in that rage, in that sorrow, um, in that old, old wound that is um, that has been in, in the US for such a long time, I think seeing so many young people getting involved in that and seeing so many young people of all shapes and sizes, of all colors, all backgrounds, all faiths, sort of linking hands in trying to address that or coming together in mourning for that. Because uh, I know, you know, we've been talking a lot about the violence, but there is also this wave of peaceful um, activism mm -hmm. and peaceful engagement that is starting to happen in, in America. So I, I see a lot of hope in that, and I'm curious to see where that will go, whether that um, intensity and that kind of uh, excitement continues, especially when it comes to younger people. Um, but, you know, honestly, I, I, I don't want to be sort of negative, <laughs> but, but I, I do see a lot of problems coming up in the immediate future. I, I think that things are going to get worse before they get better. And I think making a case for dialogue is really difficult when people's feelings are so intense uh, and so inflamed right now. But I think the only thing we can do is, is keep putting this message out there and keep letting people know that we've actually seen the results. Mm. It does actually work. It's, it's actually worth the effort. Uh, and also letting people know that each individual out there listening to this uh, can participate and can do something about this. You know, every little act of kindness towards someone that you don't know or even somebody, somebody that you know helps. You know, so in, in this kind of toxic, negative environment, the more uh, kindness and more goodness that, and more caring that you can pour into it, those are the antidotes to sort of this, this poisonous atmosphere that you're in. I, I'm not sure I'm answering your question. Um, I'd say you were. I, okay. that, that was perfect. And, and okay. it just dovetails perfectly into, you know, race, how you, how you live your life. You know, Christy wants wants something to focus on. What what would you tell her? Well, I mean, one thing we we all can do is um, remind one another to treat everyone with respect as human first, regardless of sexual orientation, race, religion, ethnic and cultural background, and uh, teach our children kindness giving forgiveness empathy before they're exposed to racism intolerance uh, hate and violence that is the very basic we can do within our family within our uh, friend circles and whatever we have access we can start within uh, within uh, we're going to start there with with um individually and then we can slowly increase the cycle the circle in our family and then friends and then slowly we can go bigger I remember I, I have a couple of boys and I remember one, one of them is in his early 20s. Uh, the other is still a teenager. But I, I just remember as a parent, you know, when when your child asks you, Dad, how come how come that boy's skin is darker than mine? And then instead of being afraid of that conversation, you just say, well, his 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 ancestors were from a different part of the world. Ours are from that part of the world. And and you develop this dialogue with your kids. And, and when you explain our differences and our cultural and religious differences as honestly as you can. My experience has been that it shows our kids that hate is an absolutely absurd position to hold. Mm -hmm. When you describe the world truthfully, they, they, they think of how could I ever hate someone because of this? And then the absurdity of hate becomes, becomes apparent. And I just, it's, it's too bad that, that that some parents are perpetuating stereotypes and racism and their kids are learning that and then they're passing it on and it's just a it's a cycle like like you say um i want to read another question from gerald this is a really interesting question that i think a lot of people are wondering um good question gerald many politicians tell divisive stories to stay in power it works how can that be changed um, Dia, you said earlier that that fear is at the heart of most of this hate, and we know that fear is at the heart of of racism as well. Mm. What what would you tell Gerald? 
Well, Gerald, you're absolutely right, <laughs> first of all. And I think how we change it is, again, just like with the media, it's, it, it comes back to us. You know, we, we get the leaders that, that, that we vote for. Uh, we get the media that we that we give uh, you know clicks to or, or 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 eyeballs to. So I think we have to start playing a more active part in uh, what it is that we demand uh, from um, people uh, in those those layers of our society. I think you know the way politicians speak about each other. I, I, okay, I think. I mean, I don't want to get into the whole Trump thing necessarily, but when he said, when he spoke to a, a part of America and said, you are forgotten no more, I think that's one of the most incredible things I've ever heard any politician say. And, and the reason I say that, and I'm, and I'm not a Trump fan, just to make that clear, but I think we need our politicians to acknowledge the 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 suffering and the struggles and the fears that people have just because the fears that we hold are irrational or are unpleasant or are ugly doesn't mean that people don't hold them and just by saying you shouldn't think like that isn't going to make people not think it i think acknowledging everything that also surrounds those fears i think is absolutely crucial um, and I think when politicians start doing that uh, is when you see that level of loyalty building towards them as well, which is why we're seeing, you know, Trump garnering such, such loyalty from his fans, uh, no matter what he does, because he recognizes what it is that they need to hear. Um, but how do we change the politicians in that sense? You know, sometimes I think maybe it's just down to us. Maybe it's down to how we treat each other. And maybe the politicians will have to follow later. I think maybe we're, we're, we're going to spend too much time waiting for them to change. Mm -hmm. And I think maybe it's down to us. Maybe it needs to be ground up. Maybe it needs to be me, how I treat you, how you treat somebody else, and within our own communities. And, the, and, the, and maybe we need to take hold of what we can actually affect. Of course, vote, voting is very, very important to so do that part. But I think we only get the world that we want by participating in it actively and not just waiting for the media to do their part and not just waiting for our politicians to do their part. Ultimately, it's we who suffer the consequences. Ultimately, it is our kids who get stabbed or who get hurt or who get bullied, you know? So ultimately, we have to figure out a way to live with each other. So we have to make the effort that that's going to require. You know, what I always wish, what I always say is um, living together is really difficult. It's difficult at the best of times with the people that you've chosen to be in a relationship with. It's hard to live with them even, right? But we are in a situation where we have different kinds of people from all over the world with all kinds of backgrounds, all kinds of socioeconomic and racial backgrounds and religious backgrounds sort of shoved together uh, on a mass of land and we're just expected to, to flourish and do well. And it doesn't work like that. As all of us know, in a relationship that you want to be in, it requires effort and it requires hard work and it requires a commitment to each other mm -hmm. that we're going to make this work. Even when it gets really uncomfortable and unpleasant, we're gonna make it work. And as a society and as communities and as streets and, 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 and local people, we haven't made that commitment to each other that we'll get through this. We're going to make this work because we are in this together. What's the alternative? What's the alternative to making uh, making it possible for us to coexist? The alternative, you're seeing it play out. The alternative is violence. And the alternative is division and fractures. So we have to figure this out and maybe we need to stop being passive and waiting for politicians and media. Maybe it's down to us, is what I think, because at least that we can do something about. Race, do you wanna add anything to that? Sure, just one one quick thought. Sure. You know, um, the politicians are able to spread fear, intolerance, hate, and violence, as Bia mentioned, as because, because we do not treat each other with respect and kindness. And because of that, the people, you know, uh, or some of our elected officials and some people in media, they take this as an advantage because it is easy, you know, um, to divide people who are, you know, filled with fear and ignorance. So what one thing we can do moving forward that we need to start treating with 
treating each other with kindness and respect as humans first, as a fellow citizen at the same time, we need to send a signal and message to our public officials that if you're gonna run for an office, you better find ways to unite us. You better find ways to uplift us, not spread fear, intolerance to be elected. And then our situation, our, you know, our, our, um, our status, it remains the same. So if you could send that kind of message to our politicians, people in media, I think things will get better, things will get improved. The, uh, the thing that I'm struck by after having chatted with you for an hour and a half now is that when I look at you two, I see how much power a single person can have in their own lives and on the world around them. We're just looking at two individuals here, one from Norway, one from Bangladesh originally, right, Race? Yes. I mean, it's, you guys have lived a story and now you are changing the world through your passion and your hard work. And it's just amazing to me that when one person decides, even, even to take something as awful as what happened to you, Race, you took something terrible and you've turned it into the most amazing gift to the world um, that I can that I can imagine. And when I when I look at you, Dia, and I see I see a woman who was bullied and picked on as a kid, and and now you've transformed that through the power of story, and you're transforming lives through these films that you're making. And I'm just really blown away by that. And it looks like we may have lost we may have lost race. Um, Dia, do you want to leave us with anything before I turn it back over to uh, to our town hall friends? What what any any final final thoughts and and how can people connect with you and and watch your work? Um, so uh, you can find me on social media, uh, uh, all the various platforms, and also my website is dia.com. Um, I guess you know all I'd like to say is that. Um, we all have a part to play. Uh, and I, I would also like to say that um, it's really important not to lose hope. Very, very important not to lo lose hope because once we lose hope, um, then we stop. Then we stop contributing, we stop trying to do what we can. And also, you know, people that want to divide us, uh, that's also why that's the first thing they, that they want to rob us of is hope. Uh, because the minute we lose that, you know, we've handed over everything that we have um, and everything that's possible. Um, and the other thing I'd like to say is that um, really, really important to know that we cannot give up on each other. We cannot give up on ourselves and we cannot give up on each other. That's truly all we have. Um, and all of this, you know, feels too big sometimes, um, and it feels uh, impossible sometimes, and it does feel hopeless sometimes. Um, but you know, like Race was saying earlier as well, you know, when you just are able to make somebody else smile or make somebody else feel like uh, it's going to be okay or that they're okay just the way they are, and whatever whatever isn't okay, we'll try to figure that out together. Um, but that we'll be there with each other through whatever it is that's to come. I think that's the most, most important thing. And, and I understand that that becomes harder and harder, you know, the more we get kind of fixated onto our computers and our kind of online lives. Mm. Um, and I know COVID exists, but really we cannot give up on each other. I, I think is probably the most important thing I'd like to say. Race the technical glitch gave uh, gave us an opportunity to talk about you when you weren't listening. So <laughs> it was actually good. Race, do you have a final parting uh, thought that you'd like to leave everybody with? Sure. Um, you know, there are a couple of things I learned from my life, from my bitter experience and the trauma I went through, and I still carry. That you know, when you get to know the other, it is hard for you to hate them. And the other thing is that that you know in in arabic it says which means when people are mean to you people are nasty be nice back to them don't just you know treat hate with hate 
violence with violence. Just be nice, be calm, and be peaceful. Because the person who hurt you, maybe he or she didn't know any better. Or maybe he or she is going through some challenges in her own or his life. And the more we take our, the more we take control of our own action, own happiness, own peace, the more we'll be able to, you know, respond to any situation wisely and peacefully. So I would say, as Dia mentioned, that never give up. You know, always be hopeful. It is easy to say, but I'm talking about from my life experience that the day I was discharged from hospital, I didn't know how my life would fall unfold in America. And today, you know, once I look back. I see amazing thing happen, even though I went through terrible things, but amazing thing happen because I never give up and I never lose my hopes, my dreams and my faith in God. So I would say the same thing that no matter how challenging it is, how tough it is, there is hope for tomorrow. There is better day tomorrow. Yeah. Well, I'm inspired by both of you and what a treat this has been to spend uh, the time with you. Both of you keep up the great work and we'll be watching and let's all do this again sometime. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much for having Thank you, us. Yeah. And Candace, Thank I'll you turn, it, turn it back over to you. Thanks, yeah, if, if I can just for a minute, I just wanna uh, bring over a comment from YouTube from Sharon Perez. She just says, thank you for your amazing and courageous work. Um, three generations of our family are watching and we appreciate you so much. So I just wanna make sure that you hear that and see that. Um, and I wanna thank you as well. I have been very humbled by um, both of your stories and inspired. Um, I think a lot of us are learning how to interact with people that have very different views, very, very uh, views that are very apart from our own. And it's, you know, we really need this message right now. And um, so thank you both so much for your work. Um, and I want to thank everybody in the audience for uh, watching tonight. Um, if you click on the button we have here on the Crowdcast uh, channel page, you're going to go over to the World Without Hate. Uh, website, check out um, more of what they're doing and how you can get involved. Um, and I want to wish everybody a, a peaceful evening and we hope to see you again soon. Thank you so much. Bye bye all. Thank you.